But right now, here he is, it's Richard Spur. Lucky I'm so svelte, isn't it, Ben? Isn't you it? and me both. Don't need those injections. I wish. Still to come, but first, up to a million sickness and disability benefit claimants are to be ordered to seek work. If you're deemed capable of work, you could have your benefits docked if you refuse to cooperate. So this morning, is cutting Britain's benefit bill the way to get people back to work? If you're on benefits, what will persuade you to get yourself a job? And do you feel that too many people who are receiving financial help from the state are simply lazy or work shy? I want you to call me now on 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation with Richard Spur. Good morning. In the news today, up to a million sickness and disability benefit claimants are to be ordered to seek work. Unveiled by the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stry, tonight, the Blitz is aimed at slashing the £26 billion welfare budget. An estimated 2.5 million incapacity claimants are deemed unable to work and, according to the Daily Mail, languish on handouts. But ministers believe that this total could be cut by hundreds of thousands if those excused work because of mobility or anxiety problems are told to look for employment. This morning, I want you to call me and tell me whether you feel that cutting Britain's benefit bill is a good way to get people back to work and an ethical way to get people back to work. If you're on benefits... What would persuade you to get yourself a job? What would make it easier for you to be able to become a member of the economically active? And, well, I wonder whether you feel um, that too many people are receiving financial help from the state for reasons which aren't justified on 0345 6060 Here is the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, announcing the government's new employment plan during a statement in the Commons yesterday. The work capability assessment doesn't reflect how someone with a disability or health condition might be able to work from home, yet we know many disabled people do just that. Our plans include taking account of the fact that people with mobility problems or who suffer anxiety within the workplace have better access to employment opportunities from the rise in flexible and home working. We are consulting on whether changes should be made to four of the activities and descriptors that determine whether someone can work or prepare to work to reflect changes in working practices and better employment support. And here's Labour's response from the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, Liz Kendall. This is not a serious plan. Yeah. It is tinkering at the edges of a failing system. Exactly. But if you run your NHS into the ground for 13 years yeah. and let waiting lists for physical and mental health soar, if you fail to reform social care to help people caring for their loved ones, and if your sole aim is to try and score political points rather than reforming the system to get sick and disabled people who can work the help they really need, you end up with the mess we have today. A system that's failing sick or disabled people, that's failing taxpayers and failing our country as a whole. Well, Mr Stride, who you heard from first there, has assured MPs that a backlash from disability groups uh, with the uh, MS Society saying they would create worry, fear and the real threat of major financial loss was an issue. Rishi Sunak said that helping people back into work would transform lives, providing not just greater financial security, but also providing purpose that has the power to benefit individuals, their families and their communities. He said the steps we're taking will ensure that no one is held back from reaching their full potential through work, which is key to ensuring our economy is growing and fit for the future. Um, it has caused some unrest amongst those groups that uh, support and represent people with disabilities, uh, people who claim that they are not uh, able to work and who receive financial help from the state. I, I think this is a, a hornet's nest. I think it's an incredibly prickly issue. Um, we are in a situation where we've got high inflation, we've got a cost of living crisis, the government is heavily in debt. £26 billion pounds is the current welfare budget. Would slashing benefits for those who the government deem are fit for work, but who themselves have claimed are not fit to work, 
get some sort of traction when it comes to the employment crisis that we have in this country. Are you on benefits? Are they sufficient? What do you think of these proposals? 0345 606 973. Call now. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC. Or tell Alexa to send a comment to LBC. James is in Glasgow and uh, says this policy sounds like a recycled work capability assessment. But let's go first of all uh, to Tracy, uh, who is in Birmingham. Good morning, Tracy. Oh, hello. Um, the reason I'm really fuming, I've heard about this over and over again. Um, I have um, multiple disabilities and I'm on PIP. And um, the thing is, it's always, always, always about us. We're always the scroungers. We're always like the benefit um, people, the benefit frauds, etc., etc. I've worked all my life. I'm nearly, well, I'm nearly 58. And I've worked all my years. And I've got different disabilities. And I'm not going to talk about them. And there must be loads of people like me. And, you know, to get PIP in the first place, the interrogation is horrific. The, um, it's really embarrassing as well. And just to go through everything, really, it's so difficult to get PIP in the first bloody place. Tracy, b before you continue, can you explain what PIP is? And yeah. why you're getting it, and and why the interrogation is so is so un unsettling? Yeah, it's called personal independent payments. God knows what that means. Right, bit of jargon. Yeah. Yeah, it's jargon, and what it means is it means you're disabled and you can't work. Yeah. You are unable to work. Okay, that's yeah. what it means. Mm -hmm. And you, you you feel that you you are you are unfairly interrogated in order to to, um, to no, receive it. No, no, no. Um, um, at the moment, yes, I cannot work, and that's my own personal reasons, okay. which I've been judged by. I won't I won't force you to to talk about. Yeah, yeah. but what um, what the hell is this? What more prejudgment? are we supposed to go through because what you don't realise is what currently happens it's really 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 tough mm. to even get it believe me it's not just about your GP you have to sit in front of these people and you think who are these people they're not bloody um, specialists you go through all this and hope and pray you're going to get some benefit to help you survive. Hmm. Do you understand me? Yes, I do. It's not us people taking the piss. I don't even understand how people can take the piss because it's really, really bloody tough. And on top of that, you've got to have your... Do you know, they... Um, do the documentation searches with the GP and what have you. Yeah. I, I, might, I, I, might, I might just say, Tracy, um, you know, uh, apologies to anyone who may be offended by that slightly colourful language. What, what, what do you make of this idea of trying to slash the welfare budget for the good of the nation because some disability benefit claimants are not claiming in, a, in, a, in an honest way? Yeah, well... Um, I don't understand how to do this, to be perfectly honest. Have you actually ever, um, look, to be, to, to be honest, I don't know how to do this. If anybody is doing um, that fraudulently, I really don't know how to do any. And I'd love to know how, because if you... It's a bit of an old, it's a bit of an old trope, isn't it? You know, the, the, the person who claims they've got back problems and spends every single day down the pub, uh, yeah. drinking six pints and uh, smoking 60 cigarettes a day yeah, with their, with their, changed. with their benefit payments. And yeah, th th there are, there the are people, there are people like that. There are people like that. But no, there are. There aren't. You're wrong, sir. That's 
Do you really think no, Tracy, the Tory government allows that? I no, mean, no, Tracy, please, I'm, I, don't don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm I'm not suggesting in any way that the majority of people who claim um, allowances no, for disability are, are 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 dishonest. But there are no. always but there are always going to be those who who try to sort of screw the system, aren't there? Yeah, there are. But thing is, God knows how they do that now because you have to have all the checkups via the GPs. Everything. I mean, oh God, I know that you don't know who I am, so I can say I've got epilepsy and everything else, and they check everything out. They check everything. You've got to give your GPs, your medical records. I don't know how, and how anybody could even do any fraud, to be honest. Sounds I like it sounds it. like it sounds like that you you're um, not interrogated but assessed pretty pretty thoroughly for this. Well, it's not just me. That's I don't mean just you. Is. I mean, sorry, I should say that's, one one. No, people. I know, but that's how it is now. And what this government wants to do is make out everybody's being fraudulent. Do you understand me? Yes. They just need the money. I aren't even able to get it. Derek's in Glasgow. Derek, good morning. Hello there, how yeah. are you doing? I'm okay. What would you like to say? Uh, I was a little bit nervous. Um, Don't be. I think uh, um, you might have covered some of this stuff. Um, yeah, it just seems like it's a recycled kind of work capability assessment, which is a really humiliating experience if you have to go through it. You have to take your medication in. And you have to go through all these questions, and they ask about your thoughts, and um, it, it, it's really humiliating. And um, I, when I was listening to your um, last caller, and you made the point that um, it's not the majority of people that are sort no. of like swinging the legs. No, indeed not. You know. I, and all that, you know, but there is that sort of thing where people see it, when it comes to mental illness that, mm, yeah, well, everyone gets a bit down and all that. And I go, well, do you think I duped my doctor, my psychiatrist, my psychologist to the point where they were considering that ECT might be? Um, the solution. Now, don't get me wrong, everyone thinks ECT, one flu or the cuckoo's nest, is very effective for some people with um, mental illness. But uh, this, this thing of, um, when they're saying about um, work coaches, is that what they call these people that are going to try and help people get back into work? The people that you talk to if you go to the, what, what used to be called the job centre, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, what, what experience do they have with people with mental illness or or, or a physical illness? I, I, I mean, I, I, they're just not qualified at all. And the, the problem is negotiating that system. If you feel you're pushed or having to be pushed back into a job and then... You, you have another episode, you have to come back out and then you have to renegotiate that labyrinthine s system for benefit all over again and you might not be eligible. Mm. And um, I, I just think that's the danger that there's going to be people who are just, well, you know, you have like, they talk about sanction, but there's going to be a gap in between if people are not coping between that and getting money afterwards. I've, I've got a friend, Derek, who um, was working in retail um, for quite a number of years and was dismissed for a completely erroneous reason frankly. Uh, I can't mention it. It's an ongoing legal case. But I can't, I can't name the employer or him. But he is finding it so, so difficult um, with universal credit. It's not enough to pay your bills. It's yeah. it, they ask embarrassing questions. You feel belittled. It's, the, the system's not fit for purpose. I'm so yeah. sorry. I'm so sorry for him. He's not disabled. But, you know, it, it, 
w it's a different category, but but at the same time, I don't think yeah. people should be made to feel like second-class citizens because they're not able for a particular reason to earn money. And he's become very depressed because he lost his job, and he doesn't yeah. have the motivation to get another one. Well, yeah, and I understand absolutely. that. And you know, okay, it's not that his legs aren't don't work. You know, it's not that he is physically ill, but he's, su he's suffering from depression. And it's very hard to motivate yourself to get a job when you're suffering from depression. That, to me, is a similar disability to someone who can't walk. Yeah, and the thing is, with depression, it's, um, it's really difficult to find a drug regime that actually works for you. Uh. You know, because the thing is, GPs have limited... It, sorry, I don't mean that yeah, to send that derogatory against GPs. But they don't have enough training, even though about 20% of what their patients will be, it will be people with mental health illnesses. And unfortunately, now the waiting list to get to a psychiatrist is so long that it, it, it's really bad. And I, I really feel for your, for your friend. Um, yeah. And... Um, uh, tell him just to <laughs> keep going, mm. you know, um, and, and that's it, you know, because because it does feel like sometimes that he, he's everyone's been, against you. He's been made to feel that he's just not capable of doing anything. It's so sad. But you, this is the thing, because you, you get to a point where you, you just reach this point of inertia. Yeah. Where sometimes just going to the corner shop it's like a Herculean task. Exactly, well, but that's that's depression, isn't it? You know, it's it, firstly it's difficult to get out of bed. Secondly, it's 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 a Herculean task even to have a wash. Then put your yeah. clothes on. Oh, then yeah. then go to the shop. Um, people don't realise. People don't realise what it does to you. Yeah, I mean, there was one point. I, I'm not trying to trivialise it. No, no. There was one point that I would wake up and I would go into the bathroom and I would look at the shower and I was terrified my shower. Mm. I, I, I know how stupid that sounds. It doesn't sound stupid at all, I understand. I, because I thought, oh, my God, I have to, oh, and wash my hair and, yeah. oh, and, it, 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 and that's it. And I, I can totally understand that. Mm. And, you know, and everyone has off days, but people don't realise that once that sort of accumulation starts, it 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 just it, it, it just progress it, 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 it snowballs really. Yeah, absolutely and, right. And I think that um, just the current way that things are, that there's such a long wait to get proper help. Um, that um, this is what's um, exacerbating the whole thing. Great talking to you, Derek. Thank you so much for your call, uh, Derek in Glasgow. When you call, 0345 973 We'll talk more in a few moments' time. I'm Richard Spur. This is LBC at 121. This is LBC. Richard Spur on LBC. Call 0345 973 Good morning. Up to a million sickness and disability benefit claimants are to be ordered to seek work this morning. Do you feel that slashing benefits for those who perhaps could actually work might help to solve the employment crisis? And if you're on benefits, what would get you back into employment? Uh, text here from Katie in Bristol to 84850 says, I'm long-term unemployed. I apply for jobs I can get to, but I'm turned down because of my age and the fact that I rely on time-restricted buses. I feel for you, Katie. Uh, Anita, hi. I've been wondering when the issue of persons on benefits, uh, some for years since leaving school into their adult years, uh, it's outrageous. There are the migrants, etc., who are employed in jobs that these people could perform. It's just like single people in three-bedroom council properties. Shocking. I don't know about that issue about migrants. We know that's the old trope, isn't it? You know, these people, they're coming over here, taking out jobs. Well, often they do jobs that British people won't do, like cleaning toilets and picking potatoes, because British people won't do certain jobs. Heather's in Wareham. Morning, Heather. Oh, good morning, Richard. Good morning. Good morning. And what would you like to say? Um, so, I, I can see things from both sides. Um, as, as um, you know, I've spoken a few times before, so I've got fibromyalgia, which causes widespread pain and muscle spasm. It's a, it's a condition of your nerves, isn't it? 
It's the uh, muscles. And the M- oh, muscles, tissues. right. Okay. Yeah, so it causes, for me, I, I get it all over my body, um, and I get muscle spasms yeah. and a lot of pain. Yeah. Well, I take pain meds for that, uh-huh. but that still doesn't put me in a position where I'd be on a par with anyone else. Mm. So, for me, the other health conditions I've got as well, it's not like, oh, you can't walk, we'll give you a wheelchair, then you're in the same position as someone else. It's healthy. It's and, and that's often missed with a lot of people. They think, oh, that's all right, if you're a painkiller, you'll be fine. Yeah, but what about the chronic fatigue syndrome I've got? Mm. And what about the other health conditions I've got? And the fact that it's just like your previous guest um, just spoke about, the mammoth task of having a shower. It's, I've got to get undressed, I've got to get in the shower, there's the stimulation of the water and being rubbed, having your hair washed and the shampoo, the soap, getting out, getting dried, getting dressed. It's it's a mammoth task in itself. Um, and I can't be relied to be awake at any particular, you know, for every Thursday, 10 till 2 or whatever, because I don't know how I'm going to feel from one hour to the next. You, you're, you're, not a, you're not able to keep regular hours. Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. And then on the other side, I think one thing the government could do that would be a positive thing is writing to the people who are on disability benefits and saying, would you like to go back into work? If so, this is what we can do for you. So for an example, my son... We we're going through trying to get him the right support he needs for his autism and um, sensory overload and depression, the support for university. Uh. But if he can't get the right support to help him with that, he does want to work. But he's going to, I don't know what schemes are available, if any, but he's going to need <clears throat> somebody to work with him to go through what he's capable of doing. Because he couldn't work in a shop because you've got the beeping and machines, you've got the buzzing and flickering of the lights, you've got all the people. Heather, I'm terribly sorry that we haven't. There's a slight sort of muffled, muffled quality to your your line. Is there any way you can click improve it? Um, is that better? It is a lot better. I don't know what you've done, but yes, it is. Carry on. Put the phone closer to my mouth. You put the phone closer <laughs> to your mouth. This is always a, this was a simple solution. All right, yeah, carry on, carry on. Um, so for him, I. Then I don't know if this exists, maybe somebody that's listening might know, um, but it would need, like, for people with conditions who do want to get back into work, have some sort of access where they can try different um, workplaces to see how they can cope, because you can't just make them get a job, because if they can't cope because of a medical condition and they leave, they make themselves voluntarily unemployed, and then you can't get the benefits straight away. So, you know, I think the money would be better invested in those people that are disabled and want the help to get back into work. I, I suppose... They're we, capable we, we, if they have the support. If they have support. I mean, we talk, we, it really, I think this is a question, <clears throat> is, is, is the carrot better than the stick, uh, or vice versa? What about the, the idea of flexible working? So, for example, um, if, you know, you're not sure whether you're going to be up to it on a particular day, uh, you can have flexi hours, you can do a job that isn't time sensitive, and maybe you can work from home. Do you think that that would be a good incentive for people who otherwise would just simply not work and claim disability allowance? Well, for me, I, I don't see how I could manage to do anything other than what I'm doing now because it's hard enough living daily life. Um, I don't go to clubs. I don't go out. I don't, when I say clubs, I mean like craft clubs or anything. Uh, um, society, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I spend time with my daughter and my grandchildren when they come over, but I'm not capable of even going out to the local craft, you know, crochet group, because most of or church even, you know, the time comes when it's, you know, the church is on, and I wake up, and it's like 8 o'clock, and I'm like, <clears throat> okay, well, I've got to leave by this time, and so... Like, do I rest a bit more? Do I get dressed? 
and then it comes to it and I'm just so exhausted or in so much pain that I just can't go. You know, and I would love nothing more to be fit and healthy and working. You know, I feel I've got so much to give to other people, but it's anything I give extra at the moment is at the expense of my own health, and I can't do that. What would help you most? Um, if I didn't have the pain... No, I know, um, but I'm, unfortunately, I, I understand that. But given that you do have the pain, what would help you most in terms of what the state might offer you to allow you to work in some capacity and use your undoubted skills? A cure. <laughs> yeah, all right, I know, I, I know, I know. Unfortunately, I just can't think of anything that someone could do because I'm always fighting, like, the pain killers do help a significant amount but they still restrict me and then with the chronic fatigue i can go from sitting up having a conversation like with yourself and then a couple of minutes later i can be feeling like i'm physically shaking inside and have to lie down because i was so exhausted mm. and after 26 years of this uh, it's it's horrid I'm not surprised. But if um, they could invest money in helping, like, with my son, you know, some kind of setup where they can visit different um, job locations and mm. see how they can cope with support from, yeah. like, a support worker, that would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, if anyone knows of that, well, <laughs> let well, us know. If they do, we will uh, put them in touch with you. Sa- uh, Heather, thank you so much for uh, getting in touch. I wish you the very best. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. We'll talk more in a few moments' time. Uh, this is Richard Spur, LBC, and at uh, a little after half past one, the headlines come from Tim Daly. This is LBC with Richard Spur. Up to a million sickness and disability benefit claimants are to be ordered to seek work. If you're deemed capable of work, you could have your benefits docked if you refuse to cooperate. This morning I'm asking whether you think that cutting Britain's benefit bill is the way to get people back to work. If you're on benefits, what would persuade you to get yourself a job? And do you feel that too many people are receiving financial help from the state erroneously? 0345 6060973. This says... Uh, hi Richard, please don't read my name out. My daughter's boyfriend, his brother and mother all receive PIP and housing benefit. They are all alcoholics and permanently signed off work. The sister is a drug addict and is in the same position. Believe me, there are folk out there who know how to work the system. I'm so sorry for your friend and I hope they are in touch with mental health services. Thank you very much indeed. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Phil, you're a first time caller to LBC in Devon. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, I'm glad it's a good morning for you. It's not for me. I'm sorry to hear. Uh, that. I've spent ninety minutes today at uh, the job centre, which is uh, twenty five miles one way and twenty five miles return. I've been on universal credit. For five years, it was August the 25th, uh, fourth, was my universal credit, five years. I've, uh, I'm actually part of uh, a group claim against the DWP that's already won. Uh, and uh, we have, we've won our case on the grounds of unlawful discrimination, but we haven't been paid nothing. From the time I went on to universal credit, my benefits were dropped. I was, I have had, I've been stolen. I've had uh, my my disability premiums, which were called legacy benefits on ESA, £350 per calendar month removed from my, data, from my universal credit. Anybody that thinks, you know, for people in my situation, there is no chance of me going back to work. I sat for 90 minutes a day broken. At the job center, I took in all my medication. I was forced to go in because the universal credit uh, helpline is not a helpline; it's a disaster line, and it's leading me. It's it nearly took my life eighteen months ago. I I went down the road of suicide, and ended up in hospital for seven days. I was sanctioned after that. I had my benefits stopped. I nearly went homeless. Because for seven months I was traumatized in bed for 22 hours a day. 
and I couldn't get out of bed, not knowing, and because of depression, I wasn't opening my post. I didn't realize that all my uh, housing benefit is tied to my universal credit. Let me assure you of this. Today was really, really revealing to me while I was sitting there broken uh, behind a screen desk. Uh, I was told back in April that my case was referred, and this was after my phone call to LBC in December when I was freezing cold. And uh, thank you to all the listeners out there. Some of them listening now will re remember my name. But I... Um, I, I know for a fact today that on the April the 23rd, um, the job centre manager, uh, they won't say Bucharia, but it's uh, 25 miles from here, rang, uh, spoke, took my case to the higher management at uh, the DWP, and they've done absolutely nothing about I, it. I hope you won't I, find... I have, I've written to my MP... It was my MP that LBC rang, and my MP lied to LBC, and he lied to me, and I've written over 25 letters, because my MP knows that I really have struggling with my, with, uh, my universal credit, and my MP has not responded at all. I hope LBC never, ever refer people back to their MPs, because our MPs aren't working for us. They're working for themselves. They don't, uh, you know, they're not interested in people that are suffering. So I've mate, mate, to, mate, I've Phil, Phil, I'm I've so sorry. Um, Phil, Phil, if I may, Phil, if I may interrupt, yes. Um, yes. I hope you don't think it's impertinent uh, if I ask you what your disability is. I don't want to talk about my disability. I've talked about it openly okay. on LBC. Right. I don't want to do that. Okay. You have no idea what, uh, how terrifying it is and uh, what, uh, the feedback that you get from other people is awful. But can I just tell you something today? Um, my universal credit journal isn't for EWP, it's for me. I have two lots of universal credit journals because I've had to go through sanctions. I've had my benefits stopped for appalling reasons. Absolutely appalling reasons. Uh, I've been, gone into debt of over £5,000 of debt because of the universal credit system. I've walked in today, I've walked in today and I am resigned to leaving universal credit. I want out yeah. of this country. I'm so sorry, Phil, to hear that you've had such a dreadful time, but thank you for sharing your situation with us on 0345 606 0973. Luke's in, Orping, uh, in Orpington. Morning, Luke. Good morning. Good morning. What would you um, like to say? Okay. I'll just be brief or as long as you want, whatever. But uh, my story is... Um, just turned 40, just 42, I think I am. Uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, age 35. I've spoken a couple of times in the past, I think. My story is that I was working for a um, private company. <clears throat> Released from my company when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I said a bit off from benefits. So I came up with the idea of setting up a company in my mind. Got the plans down. Went to the job centre. Dressed very smart. Wasn't allowed in the queue because I didn't fit in. They thought it wasn't a benefit case. Uh, so they sent me around the corner. Uh, into upstairs and I said I don't benefit to the job centre I said I want to start a company a cleaning company I want to employ people downstairs and clean the towers in the distance which are um, which was Canary Wharf so I'm just trying to let go of my fork here um, and uh, sure enough within nine months I've seen seven towers I've since gone to build quite a big company which uh, has helped over 200 mothers back into work 37 fathers and I've done more with Parkinson's than without not because anyone helped me with the idea of starting a company because I could just send benefits, but because I use it as a reason to be someone myself and wake up each morning, dream big, and chase them trains every day. What would help you most, and, and what do you make, Luke, of this concept of ordering some people on sickness and disability benefit to okay. get to work? Well, look, <laughs> many people look to medicine for relief. For me, it's about number seven in the line. Business is one of my best diagnosis, uh, be best uh, medicine you can take. Running a business or having some sort of goals or hobbies or something like that. For me, it's business. Um, it's also my faith. It's also friends and family around me and love for people and so on. But that's so interesting, that's isn't it? The idea that many, you know, that some people who are on disability benefits and perhaps for mental health reasons, 
if they were to be encouraged back into work, it would actually improve their condition. Definitely. So I'm talking to you now on the phone to quite a few people, sometimes more, if it's a different time of day or whatever. But, uh, you know, I can't even hold the phone right now. I've got it resting on the box on my table. So I thought it would be my phone would be going all over the place because of the tremor. Um, but I still, you know, I think what can, your question was what can help, was it? Yes. Well, that was one uh, of my, it was one of my questions. Yeah. Yeah. So what can help? I think encouraging things in society that's already there but struggling to have more impact. Yeah. That means community hubs, that means youth groups sort of get into a problem in the future. That means churches. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of groups out there which actually want to help, but they just can't because either they're questioning because that you know, doesn't fit in with the work agenda or something, or they um, don't know the finances. So giving them opportunities, lots of lovely people out there who do things that are great. Um, uh, you know, and also I think if you run a business, I would definitely say they should get free business advisors. At the moment, if you want a business advisor, it's something like you know, action coach or something, you've got to pay quite a bit of money. So enough, it does work. But I think the government should encourage them to have it. I mean, we're talking about who can employ who. Well, what site own business? So many opportunities. I mean, I started a cleaning company because I knew it's zero equity required to put down. And obviously, it's a sort of company which can uh, ride above any sort of uh, recessions. So I did it. And obviously, now, you know, I've, well, we turned over at the moment this year, probably forecast one half million pound turnover, something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, we cleaned a place like the Shard and Amazon Industries and all sorts of things. So you can do great things, even with challenges. I mean, I, I have lots of challenges. Parkinson's gives you depression, gives you anxiety, gives you head in the sand, tremor, you name it. I mean, we talked about having a bar of shower, it's a massive effort for me. Getting my socks and things on, it's massive. But I don't look at them as negatives, I see them as challenges to overcome. When I do do that, I feel like I feel like a million dollars, to be honest. I mean, in the morning, I, I go to bed, it's very uncomfy, I'll go to bed in a minute, it'll be uncomfy, I'll wake up in pain. It's the only pain that's my alarm clock. But uh, what, what people don't know is I've dreamt big, okay? So then I need to chase them, to, in order to chase them, I need to move, and that's painful. 15 minutes of unfolding my fingers, straightening my back and everything else, teeth stuck to my lips, you name it, then I get to my feet. That's great, put my hands in the air, say thank you God, use me today. Seven difficult steps to my front door, to my bedroom door, and I feel like I'm on national water every morning. I then don't go to the, bed, the kitchen mirror, uh, the, sorry, the bathroom mirror, I go to the window, because I don't look back at my problems, I look at opportunities out there. And as I say, I'm obviously doing quite a few good things. And I can say since I was diagnosed six years ago with Parkinson's, quite young, I've actually achieved more with Parkinson's than without. Luke, um, I find your story um, both uplifting and poignant. Um, yeah. And what I really admire about you is that with a condition which is so debilitating, yeah. which also causes you to be depressed, and depression often leads to inertia and inactivity and apathy, yeah. that you have striven, strove, and <laughs> whatever the past participle is of that particular word, uh, I ought to know, to actually do something um, in the world of wor work, and that that has helped you. Well, you know what, my, this, when you have challenges and fears, one of the fears is, can I do this, can I do that? My biggest fear was being significant in society. I wanted to be someone, I wanted to make something. You know, in March, I was standing up in front of 500 business people at the National Entrepreneurs Entrepreneurship Awards at Leicester's Football Club to give a keynote speech. Five years before I was standing there, I was having breathing therapy and speech therapy in my, in my lounge. I'm talking to you now, obviously, quite quite well. It's late at night, so not so good, but... <laughs> Tell me about but, it. <laughs> but even during lockdown, I didn't just sort of... I mean, I, I don't even remember we spoke about five days in or something at the time, and I decided to write a book with some other entrepreneurs, and it went to number one um, around the world, uh, in several countries. And well, I, re I remember that conversation very yeah. very well. Yeah. Because it, you've got to keep setting yourself goals and targets and keep moving, yeah. and that is another word I'd have for people listeners right now. Whoever you are, challenges or not challenges. Well, momentum. Keep moving forwards. Yeah. Keep moving forward. L Don't stop. Luke, um, absolute pleasure. And uh, I have huge admiration for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Luke in Orpington. Uh, 0345 uh, Chris is texting and says, Hi there, Chris from Banstead. Uh, it's difficult uh, when on benefits. I was diagnosed with incurable lung cancer last year. I was working part-time now, uh, which helps... Uh, sorry, I am working part-time now, which helps mentally, but I don't think financially I could go back to full-time. So up to a million sickness and disability benefit claimants are to be ordered by the government to seek work. I wonder... 
whether you feel slashing benefits for those who potentially could work in different circumstances might help to solve the employment crisis and save the Treasury some money. So call me now. I'm Richard Spur, and at LBC, it's 14 minutes to two. LBC. Richard Spur on LBC. Text 84850. Good morning. Michelle uh, has just texted and says, Richard, the government likes to quote the welfare budget amount as if that is what is spent on benefits. But the vast majority of that figure is the state pension and pension credits. I wouldn't wish my illness on anyone, but I do wish that there was some sort of virtual reality machine that could allow someone to feel what another person was feeling. Maybe that way these MPs would develop some empathy or Maybe not. And Kay, we need universal basic income. Welfare pays people to do nothing, but UBI pays people to do anything. What do you think about that? On 0345 6060973. Jeff's in Greenwich. Morning, Jeff. Morning. Morning. How are you doing? Okay. Uh, nice to talk to you. What would you like to say? <clears throat> I'd just like to say that, I mean, <clears throat> there seems to be, I mean, I, I massively feel for every what everyone's saying but I'm I'm hearing a lot of lack of get up get up and go here. I mean I was on, on the bones of my arse, if I can say that on L B C but I took the nearest job that came to me, which was an usher in a cinema. And it was a zero contract hour but but there was there was opportunity to get more more shifts if you wanted and I took them all that I wanted because I needed the money and then I was reliable which then they said well he's reliable let's give those shifts to him and then eventually I was offered a job of a duty manager and I went from there and I went on and I escalated because I was keen and I wanted to get on all I'm hearing here is a lot of negative so uh, if you want to progress, then do it. Do you know what I mean? I, I do know what you mean, um, although it is worth, I think, stating that, you know, some people simply are not able to work. In that case, they need... Uh, are you talking in, in, in health reasons here? Yeah, for health reasons. And, and there's no way that they can progress? Well, the question is, um, how do you help people who have physical or mental impairments to get involved in some sort of work, um, you know, w within the context of the welfare system? Well, surely there's something in the welfare system which can look at their situation and go, no. I'm not entirely clear about what you're saying there, Jeff. Just just elaborate a bit. Well, what I mean is, is there not a doctor or a GP who is aware of what they're doing that can say this is not the situation? Very possibly. Uh, thank you. Uh, Diane is a first-time caller in Northern Ireland. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Uh, hello, Richard. Hi. Um, just the last caller, well, doctors, um, whenever you're assessed for benefits, most people, uh, doctors, your own doctor, have really no input of what the assessor decides, and I have a lot of knowledge of this. I also feel very passionately about this. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of pushing yourself forward, it's what you have to put up with and deal with. I have five conditions I have uh, very severe eczema. I have eosinophilic asthma. That's a severe form of asthma. I have fibromyalgia. And because of my background and my childhood, because of my asthma, I had a lot of trauma there. I suffer from anxiety and depression. I have been through the benefit system many, many times. And some of the things that they put you through are probably criminal to be fair. In, in, uh, just in, in what sense, Diane? Right. Um, I went through um, an assessment once and they refused my benefits. I then was taken to a tribunal with a, a barrister cross-examining me and everything that I was saying wasn't believed. There was a doctor there shaking his hand in my favour, head in his fa my favour. After the assessment, I took very, very ill. 
I was so stressed and ended up in coronary care where I remained for well into a week. I had, I was watched. I was given several different drugs. Magnesium sulfate was one of them to try and bring me around. I was incredibly ill. There's one incident. The last incident I had with PIP, I had an assessment where <clears throat> the, I wasn't informed the assessment was to take place. They just rung me up. The letter came in on the day I was to be assessed. When, again, the drop, they dropped the benefit. Again, I had to have a, a, a mandatory reconsideration and asked for the documents about how they made the decisions. Some of the things that were said were, well, she laughed. Now, anybody that knows me, I would be a humorous person. That's how I deal and cope with things. Um, but I also cried to this assessor about my background, about my past. That wasn't logged. I'm somebody who has taken overdoses in the past. Um, I also, she also said, she, the, the assessor said, um, <clears throat> seems to be breathless on exertion because she asked me about my tablets. And I couldn't recall the name, so I went to get the tablets. Um, but she soon recovers. Well, that was because I sat on my stair lift. And she didn't seem to know that I had a stair lift. And right. then, because it said there's no and adaptions in the house. Yeah, I can, <laughs> I can see that you, you've come up against a lot of sort of brick walls, uh -huh, really, in a sense. Uh -huh. um, and, and, and what would help you the most, Diane, at the moment? Uh, just leave me alone. Just stop hounding me. Just stop hounding me because of images of myself being in my coffin with them knocking on my coffin, uh, assessing me. And I just think, I just think that sometimes that people should, this is a country. Look, I did work at a time and, and I would be the first to help my citizen 110% when they're down, when they're up, no matter what. And I just think that for some people, they have to understand, I'm in a sport group. That means I shouldn't I have to look for work. That is the right decision. I own money that I can't even hardly get by because it's so sparse. And the amount of money in this country that, that, that people are making as i.e. profits and still, still they're looking to the sick and the disabled to do more harm to them. It is outrageous. Diane, I wish you all the very best. Uh, do take care, won't you? Uh, Sammy, <coughs> excuse me, Sammy's in Glasgow. Sammy, good morning. All right, Richard. Hi. What it is, right, I'll tell you my main point in a wee minute, right? But I work the new, right? I've worked all my life, right? And all I ever hear of a Tory government is it's scroungers. It's always the wee people who are to put up we all this, it's always the wee people which to pay for it. What about, it? Now, how, what about it? the people turned around and said to the government, the government's supposed to work for the people, right? So what if the main, the people of uh, Britain went to the government and turned around and said, we want you to go and catch the tax dodgers? What would happen then? You feel that the uh, Conservative government is, is a government without compassion? Yes. Always have been. I can remember in the 90s, right? And you had Hazeltine. Was it Hazeltine? On your bike, get a bike? No, that was Norman Tebbit that said that. Oh, Tebbit. You know what I mean? The, the Tories, they're always the same. The, they make out as if uh, disabled people, they make them out as if they shouldn't be on the earth. They're human beings. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you. Um, Adam is texting and says, you just spoke to a chap with incurable lung cancer. I hope he does well. He needs a DS1500. Uh, I don't know what that is, but um, if that's of some help to him, then uh, that's great. Uh, Sarah's in Islington. Morning, Sarah. Good morning. Uh, your person three callers away, they were absolutely offensive. I saying, you know, the doctor should be able to help. I have, a, I have a number of conditions, one of which is very rare. Somewhere between 1% and 3% of the population has it. Basically, I'm allergic to the whole world. I can get an allergic reaction to anything at any time. So I'm a risk to go anywhere. I'm not safe to be even 
at home by myself without my assistant's dog. I'm a risk to the society if I work. What is my? J- I take uh, antihistamines four times the recommended the recommended dose for a normal healthy person prescribed by my GP. Apart from my conditions that I get chronic pain, what is the GP supposed to do? What more can a specialist do? There is no cure. I take all the medicine that I'm supposed to that I'm supposed to take for my condition, but I'm a, I'm a, my going out. I'm at risk of getting allergic reaction. Um. I can't be at home without my assistant's dog because I'm at risk of allergic reaction. What uh, what, are, what am I supposed to do? My other conditions, I get chronic pain, I get fatigue. Yesterday was not the best pain day, so I spent most of the day in bed. Um, I take strong painkillers every day. What what are, what should the GP? What more can the GP, the specialist, do? Do, do you have um, en- Do you have enough money? No. I'm lucky I live at home with my mother. Ah, right. So you've got someone to help you. Yeah, but she's she's an older person. Eight weeks ago, she had open heart surgery. Goodness. And you really have got um, such a, a, a combination of things. I can't imagine how, how difficult it must be for you. It is. And to have that person say that if the doctors should help, it's offensive. Why don't they try? Like, I can't go out for a walk without knowing that there's a risk of me going well, anaphylactic. I think, I think some people just don't, they're not able to put themselves in other people's positions and uh, they, they often, I think, uh, lack empathy and as callers have suggested, maybe this government lacks empathy. Sarah, thank you so much and I wish you all the very best. I'm Richard Spur. After the news, the actor David Harewood has said that the government should 100% apologise for Britain's role in the slave trade. He discovered that his ancestors were themselves enslaved on a sugar plantation. Do you think he's right? On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain.